All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the September 22nd. I think this is our 12th session of Bull Sessions. And uh, my name is Mark Robertson. I'm joined here by Ken Kavula and uh, Kim Butcher is also on hand. We might actually see you if you can break away. It is Mr. McManus's birthday today, so hopefully we'll get a chance to say happy birthday to him, at least virtually. But uh, welcome to the session. Good afternoon, Ken. How are you doing today? I'm doing real fine, Mark. Uh, Natalie and I went out uh, to one of our favorite little holes in the wall for breakfast for the first time in uh, to that place in probably uh, eight and a half months. Uh, we we screwed up the courage, put on our masks, and went and sat at a corner table and uh, thoroughly enjoyed ourselves. So well, that's, that's good. Hope, hopefully, we can uh, get back to some form of normalcy here pretty soon. And we're also joined here by Kim. Kim, how's the weather down in Florida? Any hurricanes coming in? No hurricanes coming in. And today it's beautiful because we have a cold front. It's in the high 80, high 70s. Ooh. Uh, 80s and no 95s. And yesterday was, uh, as my mom called it, but ugly because it was sheets <laughs> of rain all day long. Yikes. It was ugly. All right, let's go ahead and get underway. The theme of today's session is this notion of friends don't let friends be average investors. And we all certainly try to influence the people around us to to have more success and uh, enable more things to happen in our lifetimes for the people we care about. And uh, it's, it's something that is basically a, a theme of the modern investment club movement. And as, as Jay Barry was saying in the pre-session, uh, sometimes it's a matter of trying. And it can be quite a difficult thing to quite a challenging prospect to get people to behave as investors. In fact, we're going to visit some of the, the famous story of Peter Lynch and what his friends did with some of his investing. But the entire theme is to basically keep an open mind and, and see, see what we can recognize about average investors. We're going to wrap it in a very bull oriented theme. Um, for those of you that have seen city slickers, you know, the story of Billy Crystal and Jack Palance there on the lower right. And, for those of you that haven't seen it, it's a good movie, City Slickers with Billy Crystal. It's probably about 20 years old now. Might even be more than that. 30 years, I'm aging myself. Um, it, it's basically a story about uh, three city slickers from New York City going out west and behaving like co cowboys for a couple of weeks, including herding cattle and uh, running around with a real cowboy, Jack Palance, in the role of Curly. And uh, it's just a, a good session about um, some deeper thinking and stuff like that. So let's go ahead and get underway. Well, speaking of aging, Mark, uh, Hugh has just joined us in the back room. Uh, Hugh, you're muted, so you want to unmute yourself so you can accept your birthday oh. wishes from everybody. Well, Happy thank you. Happy birthday, <laughs> Hugh. Happy birthday, Hugh. Thank you. Happy birthday to Hugh. Oh, that's all. <laughs> all right. You guys all know the drill by now. No investment recommendation is, is intended. This is all about education. It's about illustration. That word demonstration is very special and very important to us. We're trying to show how we as a community do this stuff. We will be taking a look at some of the analysis and philosophy and the techniques of the modern investment club movement. And uh, that's what this is all about. We do a monthly webcast. That's going to be part of the subject matter here for today, the monthly webcast, which is free and held on the final Thursday of every month. Thir Did I say Thursday again? Final, you said Thursday again, final Tuesday. Uh -huh. We'll try Tuesday, final Tuesdays of every month at 8.30 Eastern time. Everybody's invited. If you would like a reminder uh, in the form of an email, please send an email to nkabula1 at comcast.net. And as always, if you have follow-up questions or would like copies of the slides or anything like that, we do post the slides at Manifest Investing, and 99% of you are subscribers, so you know that you can find them in the forum, but mark our at manifestinvesting.com if you have anything else. Mark, I'd like to do a save the date right about now, too, if I could. Uh, on November 11th, 12th, and 13th, that's November 11th, 12th and 13th, uh, the Mid-Michigan chapter uh, co-sponsoring the Stock Watchers Conference. 
Uh, we're co-sponsoring it with Manifest Investing, and we'll be running a series of classes and activities over the, that three-day period. I'm just asking you to put the date on your calendar right now, the Stock Watchers Conference, and there'll be much more information coming out in October. Good stuff. Thanks, Ken. So now I can actually start building some promotional material for that conference. Good stuff. Fantastic. Yep. All right. So we are going to cover friends. Don't let friends become average investors. We'll define average investors, but uh, also wanted to talk a little bit about passive investing. And we're not going to hit the third one too much today, but Ken and I are working on some real money demonstration portfolios that we'll be rolling out here shortly. And I do want to sneak up on a question because we've gotten it from so many people. Where are so many banks, in fact, regional banks near the top of our screens right now? So we're going to dive in and take a look at that for a minute or two. Um, the current report on Apple is out at Value Line. It's in this week's update batch. And I just wanted to point out a couple of things that I don't think any of us could have seen coming. Uh, I don't know if it's real or not yet, but there have been upgrades in the sales growth forecast a little bit on the profitability side and a major uptick across the board with respect to expected or forecasted PE ratios. The net result of all that is the PARs are a little bit higher than they used to be. And uh, again, just a very strong company. It continues to be our number one most widely followed stock. So we are gonna be taking a look at some of this stuff in uh, a little more detail. I will tell you the one thing that's really kind of gnawing at me, and we'll probably cover this in the next week or two, are these numbers here. And uh, much like we did with Amazon a few weeks ago, I want to go back and take a look at what that projected return on value looked like through that entire time when we actually sold off our shares at the round table uh, due to the low return forecast. And uh, I just want to say that's one more uh, annoying uh, moment for us because I'm I'm still not recovered from selling Apple from the round table portfolio and little let alone not putting a tra trailing stop limit order on it to uh take advantage of the momentum. So Ken I guess I'm confessing that I'm still I'm still crying myself to sleep at night. <laughs> was selling Apple well, Mark, a few months we, ago. we do have a comment about the two prices at the top of the column and I'll direct people down about six or seven lines to projected shares outstanding. And you'll notice that the split is taken care of, not in the price. That's that's the actual prices on those dates, but it, they're paired with the actual share counts as well. So the split is being taken care of by noticing that the shares have gone up by a factor of approximately four. Yep. Yeah, that's pre-split and post-split, <laughs> left and right. All right. I just wanted to chip in here on Apple, if I may. P please do. So I, I don't have the uh, Apple Watch or the iWatch, as I've heard it called once or twice. I've been corrected when I ever say them. But um, I do have Fitbit, and about a week ago, Fitbit said that you had to they give the option of downloading a new interface for the watch. Well, the deal is that the Apple Watch and Fitbit and a number of other um, uh, wrist-wearing tools have been able to measure the oxygenation level in the blood for some time. But the FDA, because it's a medical device and it's giving medical information, has an approval process and wouldn't allow them to report that information. So they did subtle things. Fitbit, for example, didn't give the absolute number, but it showed if it was changing higher or lower as you slept, things like that. Right. Interesting. A week, two weeks ago, you downloaded the firmware, and all of a sudden, your absolute oxygen levels were shown. Now, that's significant because if these things become medical devices, which it appears they are, Apple, Fitbit, the work will have just a slew of information that heretofore was simply not available. The, the thing that Apple will be able to do as well, by the way, is to take it's a one point, but it's very suggestive of an EKG. It will be able to monitor diagnostic tests. Uh, continuously, uh, and this augurs really, really positively for Apple's stock price. May not be evident today why this capability is significant, but they will be accumulating data which was not ever available and should be able to do forecasts on the health 
uh, in ways that just can only be imagined today. So this is so this technological shift or this permission shift uh, augurs really well for Apple. Yeah, I have to agree. After spending time worrying about my mother's O2 sat levels a year ago, um, yeah, this would have been a game changer. And it's uh, it is fascinating to see that Apple's been given permission to do this. Yeah, Hugh, I, I just would like your opinion. Do you see this growing into uh, any kind of metered response where perhaps they could deal with something like blood sugar? Yeah, that'll be next. Wow. Wow. It'll be right across the board. They they will. I mean, it's um, a near infrared technology that, um, and I guess the computing power on these things is so amazing that they should start. They should soon be able to monitor other things in the blood. I'm just thinking of the uh, of the the sheer size of the the sales uh, for something that would easily and quickly uh, keep an eye on blood sugar. Uh, for you know, hundreds of thousands of people throughout the country. Yeah, I mean, for example, I, if if I'm a dad enough, you are too, Ken. Mark, you are. You're not, you know, not background, etc. If I had something on my wrist that was telling me what was happening to me as I ate, it would moderate my behavior. I can tell you that it would moderate my behavior dramatically. If I had something that I liked and that didn't have a a, a bad impact on the blood system, I probably would eat more of that. I would eat less of what does harm. Now, intellectually, I know what I should eat and what I shouldn't eat, but if I had continuous feedback as to what's going on, uh, that, that would personally be a game changer, and I think for many people. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> Absolutely. I can't, I, can't even, I can't even imagine. At the risk of sharing too much information, I have a procedure known as a colonoscopy tomorrow and I'm, I'm looking forward to the day when that is a, a savagely forgotten uh, procedure perhaps by some other technology and I, I thought I was making a big shift in my my personal situation just by weighing myself more often and now he was telling me I'm going to have all this other stuff mm. so, maybe it, it'll be it to the point the yeah maybe it'll be to the point like uh, what was it yellow submarine where you take a pill and the pill Tells you everything you need to do as it goes through your system. Yeah, yellow submarine meets Star Trek. All right. Yeah. All right. Quick question and answer for everybody just to do a quick uh, Q&A. We're going to have a Q&A mailbag a week from today. So if you've got some stuff you'd like to see us dig into, this is a question from Paul Witt, one of our Groundhog champions from 2009, and he's on our all-time leaderboard. And he's commenting about the regional banks showing up at the top screens. And Ken, I think you've also noticed this, that this, this has been in place for a little while now. It's, yeah, I talked to you about it, Mark, about two and a half months ago. It's, uh, it's been something that, that I've noticed, uh, uh, and not only banks, but insurance companies, and you've highlighted both uh, as you've gone down the list here. Yeah, all these asset-based companies. And here's the short explanation of what I think I see happening. And... Uh, the top bar chart is that same profitability chart that we do for the industrial companies, only now we're looking at return on equity for just the asset-based companies like banks and insurance companies. And uh, the top graph is the companies in the database for which we have 2020, 2021, and that three to five year estimate via value line so that we can look at the earnings and the book value and actually get a return on equity projection. And notice that the numbers for 2020 and 2021 are in a bit of a downdraft thanks to the recession and other factors. Things are just kind of calming down. We're having another bank moment. And if you look down to the bottom, that bottom chart, same graph, different set of companies. In this case, it's many of those regional banks that are in the extended coverage, the small and mid-cap edition, or just uh, other community favorites that we track. And there are no estimates for book value for 2020 and 2021 yet. We're getting very close to the end of 2020. All indications are that it will be coming in, you know, somewhere down in this range. Uh, so that is part of what's missing. What, what you're basically seeing is there's this kind of trend in place here. And the, the downward slant on it, the bent, has not happened yet. So I think that's part of the explanation. Does that make sense, Ken? Uh, it absolutely makes sense to me, uh, but it 
it doesn't explain to me, Mark, why. Uh, well, it does. It does in a way. I'm gonna. I'm gonna take that back. It. It does in a way explain to me uh, why the banks are on on the best list. Uh, I guess it's because, in addition to everything else, they're really uh, pretty good bargains right now. I guess that's another yeah. way of saying what what the graphs are saying. Yeah. Yeah, and here's the price chart for these are just the S and P 500 for the for the banks, but you'll notice that they did take uh, a massive hit back in February and March, and they've not come all the way back yet. So that does explain some of it also. And last but not least, there's this noise going on that uh, apparently drug money has been flowing through banks to the tune of a couple trillion dollars. Uh, I don't know how that looks to the in comparison to the big pile of money, but there are some major banks that have been named in this uh, scuffle that's going on right now. That's all I'm going to say about that. Did that sound like so, question? Mark? If you could, if you could stay on that slide for just a second, I'm 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 struggling to understand it. Banks are required to file an SAR whenever handling funds that cause grounds for suspicion. So. They take the money, and then if they think there's something wrong with it, they file a report? Or they forget to file the report, and there's apparently okay. very very little uh, consequence of that. Okay. It's uh, interesting. I mean, uh, that's all I'm going to say about it. I don't want to have to talk to lawyers over the phone. All right. Next topic. We got, we all know this. We talk about our two-pronged approach to uh, identifying opportunities. And we think it really does make a lot of sense to find a Chris Jenner or uh, managers of mutual funds, especially we like the small companies like Brown's small company. Um, and when we go out there and do that, we basically look for, you know, the left horn being the demonstrated performance you know, actually outperforming the field of colleagues and competitors. And on the right-hand side, the solid positioning, uh, growth, quality, and return forecast. That's basically what we're looking for. And a few days ago, I shared this image. We talked about it a couple of months ago, but what you're looking at here is we cover about 540 funds at Manifest Investing. 26 of them actually have relative returns greater than that's 500 basis points or a, a 5% percentile or percentage uh, advantage to the S&P 500 or, in this case, Wilshire 5000. So you're looking at the top 25 funds. And uh, from Morgan Stanley Centerpoint down to Lord Abbott, down there at number 25 and number 26, notice there's a fair amount of technology. These are all funds that have beaten the market by more than 5 percentage points over the last 10 years. And there, there's some common themes, and we're going to circle back to this as we talk about some stuff here in a few minutes. But, you know, how much does growth matter? The average growth forecast for these 26 outperforming portfolios, and again, it's over a 10-year period, with the exception of the top three. That's actually a different time frame. You can see the start dates on those. But you're, you're talking about an average sales growth forecast of 13%. And now keep in mind how many times you've heard Ken Cavula say you want to aim for 11, 12, 13 if you really want to have solid fund performance. I think this makes the point pretty strongly, Ken. What are your thoughts? I I, I do, Mark, and, and I uh, I love that we have, we're finally getting some data that supports that number. Uh, that number originally comes from George Nicholson uh, who talked about 11 and a half to 12 and a half, but it was always something that, that I used in my presentations without a lot of support to it, other than the fact that Nicholson had suggested that might be what you needed. Uh, I'm really happy to see some some actual evidence that, that it's up closer to the 12 and a half percent end than it is the 11 and a half percent end. And uh, I, I know from looking at club portfolios, that that's something that most clubs don't pay enough attention to. They don't pay enough attention to the aggregate sales growth of the entire portfolio. And uh, many times they're, they're so laser focused on whether a stock is a buy or not 
uh, without really taking into account what is the sales growth going forward of the company and uh, you know is it is it just in an, uh, a space right now that that uh, is giving it a particularly good uh, appreciation number going forward or does it have the sales growth to continue giving a, giving appreciation for you know maybe 10 years or 12 years rather than just the next three or four or five yeah and we're, we're getting a wealth of information from this as we work through the the database upgrade with y charts um notice that we're basically mapping quality and growth and par and projected return on value and i could do just about anything with the database um it's, it's just a wealth of information. And for those of you that are subscribers at Manifest Investing, um, what we are doing is filling out the top 25 positions in all of these funds. And anytime we run into a name that's not in our coverage universe, we're adding it. So you've seen that deluge of uh, new companies that we can at least take a look at. And we're going to find some uh, interesting opportunities as we build that out. Uh, my intuition also says, Mark, on this list that that I'd like to do a little bit of work on the couple of low outliers, the seven, seven, and the eight uh, that are on that list. Uh, I'd like to find out, for example, if a lot of the uh, return is coming from a very small number of stocks uh, that we're giving outsized uh, growth uh, values as compared to the to the entire universe that they own. Uh, I'm looking at medical devices, for example, and I'm I'm kind of asking myself, uh, you know, where's that that growth coming to give you that that relative return of plus six percent uh, when it's only growing at seven point seven percent in the entire portfolio? So I'd like to try to understand that in a couple of those those low ones. There's another one up near the very top up there. It's a semiconductor um, uh, ETF as well. So uh, maybe uh, if I can sit down and look at that data or ask you to pick out some numbers for me, I can take a little bit better look at, at why these mm -hmm. lower growth ones are performing as well as they are. Sure, we can certainly do that. All right. And what I also find this to be kind of interesting because it, it's it's responsive to that quote down at the bottom, which has been bothering me, as most of you know, for at least a month, if not more, about, uh, yeah, you can take any average investor, and if you can convince them to invest in an index fund, you've certainly done a wonderful thing. But if you could somehow convince them, as we were talking with Jay Berry, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, to take that next step and aim a little bit higher, it can be such a special thing. Well, going back over 20 years, there's 12 funds on – uh, that have actually beaten the market over that time frame by more than five percentage points. That's basically three or four percent of the total universe of funds. And Ken, I really messed this up. I was weak on this a few weeks ago, so I'm going to try again. You know, your teacher standing in a classroom, you look out over your field of students, sometimes you can get a sense for which ones of them will be fairly successful going forward. And of these 12 companies, 10 of them are on both lists. So they've been on this list for 20 years. And I'm calling that persistent excellence. I mean, I don't think it's an accident that Brown's small company has strong performance, you know, over the decades. And a couple of the others that fit that same description, uh, Barron and, and some of the others. And then that next paragraph, nearly half of the funds that are that are that are in this list beat the S&P 500 or the the Wilshire 5000. So again, I don't think it's a it's a a shotgun approach. It's a, a very targeted approach of watching for these people who seem to know what they're doing and then monitor it but go along for the ride. So it, it, it's the kind of information mark that we should be laying on the desk. Uh, of people that run 401k accounts for for small, medium, and even large corporations and saying, can't you do better? Can't you give people a better choice than just a plain vanilla index? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I watch huge companies uh, give people that I've, uh, I'm close to 
give them five choices uh, over their period of work to to build their retirement uh, funds. And, and the five choices basically are so vanilla that that uh, when you finish it, you're lucky to have a 1% return uh, by the time you take fees and everything out of it, uh, let alone beat the market. Uh, you know, we, we need to, to find a way, uh, and I know it's not a top priority, but, but uh, if we're gonna expect people to pay for their own retirement uh, as we move forward, then we need to help them find a way to accumulate enough cash to make that happen. Yeah, and that's a subject we'll dig into to more detail for sure. But uh, my point is, is that I, I do believe they can be identified and uh, absolutely take an advantage of. I'll pipe in here too because I think it's only a matter of time when they're finished with those bestos and the Boy Scouts and all this kind of thing. When certain lawyers are going to turn their attention to four hundred one k's and to big companies and say. You guys limited the choice. Um, there was an option freely available to invest in a low-cost S&P index fund. We didn't provide that. And they will come after them uh, to, to make up for gaps in someone's retirement. As a result of, I'm sure what they're going to say is negligence. Yeah, it comes down to uh, education and, you know, the... The freedom of choice. Oh, the, the flip, That's what it, if it happens. Yeah, the flip side of that though is the the ones who give you 250 options, and that that puts most people, especially average investors, into a paralysis. Well, yeah, when you have too many choices, you really have no choice at all. Then you you many times go for the most uh, what you perceive as the most safety or as the, the most well-known or whatever. Len is making a good point also in our question box here that, that we have to not only, uh, look at the stock picking abilities of, of these super, uh, funds, if that's what you want to call them, super investing rhinos, uh, but we have to appreciate their ability to buy and sell at the proper moments. Uh, that doesn't mean trading. What that means is buying and selling at the proper moments, which might be two years or three years or five years apart, but it still goes on. Yep, absolutely. Good stuff. So we'll, be, we'll continue beating on that subject, but now let's talk about friends not letting friends be average investors. And we'll do a little bit to uh, define average investors, but here's a snap from the movie with Mr. Crystal. Martin. Before you get there, we have one really good question from Cynthia about that last slide. Okay. Uh, do you include expense ratios in any of the numbers that are coming out of these uh, these funds here? In other words, is that being subtracted from the performance or is this performance before expenses have been taken out? All of the calculations are net. So we actually take the the return forecast for the portfolio and deduct any of the fees. So yeah, it's a, it's a net calculation. Great. All right. So on to city slickers and riding herd over cattle. And uh, these two guys are great. I mean, I would, I would strongly encourage you to, if you haven't seen the movie, it's a, it's a good movie uh, with the two of them. It's one of Jack Palance's last, uh, acting performances he did win an oscar for best supporting actor for the movie city slickers and there's a famous oscar presentation where he, he accepts the oscar and then he does one-handed push-ups and, and and talks about the the young people that are getting all the jobs that he could have and it's just it's just a it's really a lot of fun he's just a just a really good thing but we are here for one thing and this is in fact this is the way that Ken Cavula used to open a whole bunch of Saturday sessions. We, you know, why are we here? Why are here? This, why are we here this afternoon? You know, why do we come together as a community? And I, I think that's the answer to the question, isn't it, Ken? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're trying to make everybody around us better. I know that. I know that my investing experience is better because of all of you, and uh, that's what we want to spread. So that's really what this is about. So let's talk. Let's define average investors a little bit further. Uh, many of you are familiar with the Dalbar organization, D-A-L-B-A-R. They do a study of how well 
average investors do, whether it's in funds or individual stocks. But um, what they witness is performance chasing and just bad timing and just a whole bunch of poor investor behavior. I'm not going to belabor that point other than to point out that the average investor and the number I've seen is as much as four or five percent underperforms the stock market by that type of a magnitude uh, a lot of the time. And it's just it's just amazing to watch um, the performance chasing and, the you know, the, the big hot stocks end up on TV and on magazine covers. Uh, they get talked about at the hair salon or beauty salon um, around the neighborhood barbecue and, or the infamous brother-in-law tip. All of those things, which we know better than to react to with, with anything other than a study. Uh, that's, that's one of the wonderful things that sets us apart as a community of investors is we will study an opportunity, not just simply dial a broker. Does anybody do that anymore? Now it's just a keystroke, right? Especially with Robinhood. So yeah, it's uh, it's something that I've been kind of flummoxed by for decades that uh, this is a condition. It's the type of thing that Hughes talked about with his behavioral stuff and uh, patience and discipline wins out. All right, on to uh, Peter Lynch and just this reality. Time is not a four letter word. Timing is a four letter word. I, I don't even know what to say. Every time I see this, I, I just get this lump in my throat and the hair rises on the back of my neck and I get this nausea and it has nothing to do with my medical procedure tomorrow. Um, I can't even imagine how they did this. We're talking about friends and neighbors of Peter Lynch. While he was busy generating 20% per year returns, they actually were losing money investing in Fidelity Magellan. I can't even, I can't even fathom that. Um, Again, it has to do with performance chasing, and average investors are very vulnerable to this. I did notice, not to pick too much on, on people right now, but I did notice a report that was out at, from Robinhood that talked about a bunch of people selling the NASDAQ, and they were ready to praise them for selling their QQQ shares at just the right time, like two or three weeks ago. Turned out they were selling them and moving into a triple leveraged long uh, so, so basically, they're you know triple turbocharging their holdings in the Nasdaq just in time for it to drop twenty percent. And if you triple leverage something like that, you go down sixty percent. Um, so, this behave this sort of behavior is alive and not well. Any comment on that, Ken? Well, I've read this uh, in various ways at, at various times during my. Uh, teaching career and uh, especially in my uh, association with better investing and and each time I read it I just find it amazing that that the average person uh, was trying to to time or, or game the system rather than just sit and be content with 29.2 percent per year uh, I mean how much do you really need to make before you should be content uh, with what's going on in something um it's it's it baffles me yeah and, uh, and to me it just underscores how the quarter to quarter doesn't really matter you know and i i had the honor and privilege of actually spending time with peter lynch out at our san jose national convention uh i don't even remember the time frame it would have been 1997 or 1998 so he was on the speaker tour by then and uh, but he told the story of how his neighbors would sit around the neighborhood bonfire and literally go back to their desks and phones and not behave very well. Um, just amazing, you know, and it was always, you know, watching too closely on the quarter to quarter stuff. All right, let's go ahead and keep rolling along here because we do want to spend a moment talking about the round table and just an observation and an opportunity to perhaps do better. We've been doing the monthly webcast since July 2010 and have actually been blessed with, uh, you know, some good luck and some good selection and some good stuff, but uh, a return that is in the 17 to 18% range, that's annualized rate of return, 
during a period when the market has gone up, let's call it 11%. So uh, beating the market by uh, 600 basis points or that six percentage points that we've talked about. We just celebrated our 10 year anniversary and we're off running, looking forward to the next 10 years. So that's that's a good time. But this is something that I think is always true and we're always trying to do better. We're trying to make each other better and we never stop trying to learn. Isaac Asimov is one of my favorite writers and I just think that's a powerful quote. So one of the things I thought we would share is just this list, list of the top performing selections for the monthly roundtables over the last 10 years. And they're sorted from the best return to the number 40 return. There's obviously another 500 that are off the page, but these are the top ones. The ones that are color coded or shaded in yellow are closed positions. The other ones are active. So those are still crunching away. So you can see that uh, there's a, a whole bunch of names up there. I'm I'm thankful that my name's on the list in a few places. But one of the things that we did want to talk about and just kind of do some, some city slicker style soul searching is there's only a few audience positions. A couple up here at the top, a couple down here at the bottom. Not not a whole lot of uh, appearances on here by the audience. And uh, again, it, you know, we close each one of the roundtable sele selection or sessions with uh, an audience poll and uh, just find it kind of interesting that, that uh, the audience is just basically not uh, doing as well as they might. And in fact, here's a, here's a look at the actual audience performance, actually more or less matching the market over the last 10 years. And uh, it just makes me scratch my head and wonder, what is it about it? Is there something about the process or how things are presented? I, I realize that it's a pretty much a rapid fire burst of information where the audience is asked to vote. And as Ken was saying in the pre-session, I do think it is just a, a piece of information that's all we're treating it as but can we notice some tendencies and can we you know look for possible uh paths to pursue for for stronger performance any comment on that ken i'm not sure mark that we can improve the performance of a random group of people that uh, we see once a month uh but uh, i do think that uh we can make everybody in our audience aware of the fact that that we're all trying to come up with a, a good stock idea and uh, sometimes we don't necessarily meet the spirit uh, of what we set out to do in the round table which is to come up with our best uh, uh, choice uh, for that particular month. Uh, I know that, that uh, I want the round table to be something that's interesting and that's something people will come back to uh, on a long-term basis, and I would be afraid if we were picking the same stocks, uh, you know, throughout a year. If if we did an entire year of programming and picked ten stocks, uh, I would would be afraid that that wouldn't be the kind of show that would would grab people and keep them interested for for an entire year, let alone ten years. We've had a lot of our audience with us for a long, long time. So I'm, I'm just uh, asking uh, the audience, and maybe we should make it a little bit clearer to try to wade past the story in the stock, uh, because that I think is what captures people a lot of times, and try to absorb the, the financials behind the story, try to absorb how they're going to make money, and try to absorb uh, where they're sitting right now, uh, as presented by the the presenter, uh, I think all of us uh, can easily get caught up in story stocks sometimes, and I think our audience is is uh, not as guilty of it uh, as many audiences might be. But I still think uh, that our audience many times will fall for the the beginning parts of what the company does rather than what the company is doing to continue to continue the process. 
Uh, that was a, a lot of words for, uh, I don't blame the people for not doing as well as we would, ex as we might expect, Mark. Yeah, I, I get it. And I, I think it comes down to the power of a story sometimes. And it's a, it's a behavior that's seen in investment clubs also. Uh, sometimes the, the story uh, overwhelms the, the less uh, obvious opportunity, if you want to think of it that way. I mean, I will point out, and I'm not I'm not picking on anybody here that, that, uh, I mean, for example, Hugh has had very few selections, you know, seconded by the audience. Yet his track record is the strongest among the four. All, all four of the nights, including Kim, as our guest damsel, have relative returns greater than the, than zero, beating the stock market. So it's, uh, Kind of an interesting phenomenon. So what I thought I would do is is take a quick look back at uh, I'm not sure what the total number is the selections made by the audience every month over the last ten years and compare them with the roundtable. I'm I'm just looking for something which might help explain what's going on. I think I have a few things to think about here uh, that all of us can think about. The first thing that I notice on here is the technology component of what the audience has selected over the ten year period is relatively low compared to the round table. And then what I've done is taken those 25 or 26 super investor funds and I'm showing you their distribution by sector. And I want everybody to notice that, you know, technology is obviously a fairly heavy weighting on that list. So you've got the audience basically selecting 17%, while at the same time, the, the knights and damsels have been nominating a fair dose of technology stocks. That's the only way we can get to that 17 or 18 percent. And I, I think that's a, a fairly significant observation. The other thing that which is kind of a mystery to me, and maybe we can blame this on Tim the Toolman Taylor in Michigan. I don't know. Um, look at the industrial content and notice that it's not very high. Where is it over here? I mean, 11% there, but I want you to notice that in industrials, you know, by the the leading funds, is pretty low. So this is a pretty powerful number. Notice that there is some discretionary there also. Anything, the anything jump off the yeah, page that you can? Yeah, what jumps at me, Mark, is the big pink quarter on the audience selection. Uh, I mean, the color makes it jump, but on top of that, it's a quarter of the portfolio. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's balancing the industrial part of the portfolio out, uh, and uh, maybe maybe it's true. You also tend to, when you're forced with a quick decision, uh, maybe you tend to buy a little bit of what you know rather than uh, what you're having a difficult time absorbing in a in a six minute presentation. You know. Uh, that that might have something to do with it. I mean, industrial companies many times are household names. The same for discretionary companies. So it's a recognition bias, is what I'm hearing. Uh, yeah. Well, that's but yeah, that I'm I'm just wondering if that plays into it uh, a little bit. You know. Yeah. So just some of the stuff that I I, I think and I, I wonder about. Um, Here's a look at that list of 25 leading funds. And I just want to make the point, we already made it a little bit with the average growth rate being 13%, but the red uh, circles are all under the growth emphasis. So you can see a whole bunch of growth type content here. The, the yellow shaded in ones are healthcare. Um, and by the way, Cy Lynch, if you're actually listening to the recording of this, you have to hit your mute button and ignore the next few minutes. This is where Cy could find all of his cognizant technologies and EPAM systems and those two companies <laughs> are all those consulting and software companies where uh, is is it an accident that that Cy be, you know ends up shopping amongst cognizant and EPAM and a few others uh, quite often and and it's right there for you. And, and, and I want to balance. I want to balance that as far as Cy is concerned, because I think of all of us, Mark, uh, Cy is the one that that really does make an attempt uh, to put his best idea forward on a regular basis, and he tries to stick, for the most part, 
uh, with the the model, the the up straight and parallel, the 70% of your portfolio model. Uh, I have great respect for what Hugh does. And like I say, I, I don't listen to any of his ideas anymore with a, a smile on my face, but I write them down and I buy a lot of them. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I think Cy is the, is the one that's truest to, uh, to, to what we said we were gonna do. Uh, and that that's at the expense sometimes of of picking cognizant twelve or thirteen or fourteen times uh, out of a ten year period, right? And the the other one I wanted to point out is it has to do with this retail thing. Forty uh, percent of the Baron Partners is in actual retail stocks. That's not what that retail actually stands for. It stands for retail investor. But um, notice that this one down here is pure retailers. And what is fascinating, you know, so many of us tend to to shy back from the retail discretionary stocks quite a bit, just because we're afraid of fads and we're we've been burned by restaurants that disappeared from the planet and that kind of stuff. Um, but if you take a look at companies that have delivered the best return to shareholders over the last multiple decades, you'll find many retail companies in there. So there, there certainly is a place for them. All right, so here's what I came up with, just, just again in this no, the spirit of open minds and thinking about the biases and being willing to explore different ideas. The one thing that does jump off the page at me is this 7% number in combination with some of those pie charts that you saw two pages ago. I do think that if you went back and looked at the audience polls in aggregate, you know, this avoidance of the technology stocks is is uh, perplexing because we know how well they've done and discretionary is good too. And then this notion of Tim the Toolman Taylor maybe being too much of a, a force. And as Ken was saying, this bias towards uh, brands and things that we know. But I do think that it's important to be receptive to the non-core opportunities too. And I... I see the audience very rarely selecting that type of thing. We have been suitably and rightfully brainwashed on upstraight and parallel. There's no doubt about it. And that does represent that big blue pie chart there. And I'll let Ken pontificate on that for a minute. But uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, there's, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying that you, I think in order to become better than an average investor, you might want to be willing to explore the rest of the, the, the question. What are your and, thoughts? And, and I'm, my, my thought is, Mark, that, that there reaches a place where if you can improve your performance to a certain level and then keep it there over a long period of time, then you've accomplished what it is that you wanted to accomplish uh, as a super investor. Uh, if we can keep our relative return, and remember, that will move as the market moves. But if we can keep our relative return somewhere in the five to seven percent range, uh, then I'm going to be a really happy investor, uh, especially if I can do that for excessively long periods of time. If I can do that over 10 or 15 or 20 years, um, I would love to be able to have a relative return of 20, uh, but I'm not going to push myself to the place where I uh, I tip it over and mess it all up by trying to get really fancy. Uh, I'm I'm really pleased with what the roundtable's doing. Uh, the results bear it out. We're we're chugging along pretty well. If we could improve the audience by an extra one or two percent by asking them to to just think a little bit, you know, more deeply, uh, that'd be great. But I I don't want to insult them, and I don't want to tell them that that this is life and death so uh, I'm really happy with where we're where we're at right now with the with the roundtable portfolio and I do think that we we do focus uh, two-thirds to three quarters of our stocks towards the the model towards the growth company that you need to have in a good portfolio yeah and I I just again, not to name names, but I will because it's his birthday. 
a, a lot of times I get this feeling like when Hugh presents an idea, it really is kind of like a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. It, it just needs a little TLC. And uh, there are a number of examples of that over the years. Some of those are some of the top performing selections that we've had in our, all of our venues, including the Groundhog. But uh, Hugh, would you care to comment on uh, I know you don't take it. Yeah, I have to be, I get really nervous. If, when someone walks up to me and says, thank you for recommending, because that's the verb they choose. And I have never, ever done that, you know? And I always couch what I say as carefully as I can, because I want people to, I, because I, I buy companies where there is risk. When you're at a 40, a 52 week low, or a three or a five year low, there is only bad news about that company. There's never a ticker tip parade for companies that, that said hello, right? So I just get, I get very nervous. And I was talking to Mark a couple of months ago about this. Maybe I, I downplay the presentation a little bit because there could be part of me subconsciously that really wants people to appreciate this stock but not buy it just because I said it, you know? But it was so self-evident to me to buy Bank of America when I suggested and Amazon and BP when it was busy polluting the Gulf and BP today for that matter. Right. You know? Yeah. So we're getting a really nice comment from Mary Wrench here, Mark. Uh, uh, Mary says that uh, she, well, first of all, I'll, I'll say that Mary's a, uh, been a loyal follower of the roundtable for many, many years. And uh, she does listen to what we have to say. And she says frequently she studies uh, but doesn't even consider buying what she voted for during the roundtable. With a little bit more study, she moves to maybe another one of the roundtable stocks. So if we're helping investors in that way by just giving them ideas, uh, that that makes me feel warm and fuzzy all over. Yeah, that, so, that's a great uh, comment. Yeah. And, and, nice. yeah, I mean, we're forcing them into a split-second decision uh, you know, I, I even when I run the poll, I even tell them, come on now, you got five seconds left. Uh, and and then we're, we're going to hold the numbers up and say you don't do very well. <laughs> so uh, I, I would not advise a teacher to do that in a classroom. I just don't think it's productive. You know? Of course, so. the, the other thing we could do is, is get the four of us to make micro micro small company selections and and paint the audience into corners. I don't think we want to do that either. No, absolutely not. And and again, uh, I think if you reach a point in investing where you're doing pretty well and you're very satisfied with what's going on, then your goal becomes uh, making that happen for a long period of time. If if I can live out the rest of my life now at a relative return of six or seven percent, Mark, uh, I'm going to leave my kids much more than I ever wanted to leave them in the first place. So, yeah, this stuff is pretty cool. All right, I just have a couple of slides. Uh, speaking of roundtables, and you can go to the YouTube channel, search for Manifest Investing, you'll find this page. And uh, I just invite you all to take a look if you want to go back and check out. Previous roundtables, they're all they're here going back many years, along with our bull sessions and some of our topical sessions, like the, the presentation Ken and I just made in Cleveland. But you can check that out. If you are watching one, I would just invite you to click the like, share, like button that you see there. If uh, you like what you're hearing, we'd like to see more of a particular style of topic or whatever. But please consider subscribing because then you will get notices when we post things and it just helps us out in general. I'll, I'll keep you humble, Mark. My son said to me that he went to our page and he didn't even know that I knew that many people, let alone that we could get that many <laughs> clicks on, a, on a, uh, a presentation. So uh, I'm got, pretty happy with, uh, with 100 views. I'm pretty happy with that. I've gotten some similar uh, suggestions from family members who, who love us. And we, we do love all of you and we just want to all do better. That's what this is all about. Um, Ken, here's a trivia quiz for you. Do you happen to recognize that lick shot for today? Uh, Mark, I don't. It's the no, Pet I don't. It's from the Petoskey area, and it was the home of a great writer or a uh, refuge or a 
Is this Hemingway's home? It is. It's Hemingway's house. Okay, Lake, this almost. is in Walloon Lake. Yeah, Walloon Lake, and it's Hemingway. Yeah, and I figured that fit very nicely with our bull theme and uh, matadors and red capes and all that kind of stuff, because he wrote the sun also rises, which talked this about a wonderful. lot about bulls. So this is one beautiful place you can you can peel off a hundred years as you travel around this small part of Michigan. Yep, uh, just absolutely gorgeous. And so with that, we can go ahead and shut down the, the broadcast. I appreciate everybody coming, and uh, we'll stick around for a few minutes for questions. But thanks, everybody. Hope we've uh, provoked you into thought, which will make you a better investor. And while you're being a better investor, take us all along for the ride.